Apostle writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He wants to do a work in our heart today through this song service, through the preaching of the word, through the fellowship. God wants to do a work in us. He wants to continue that work that he begun, salvation until the day that his son comes back to take us home. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the fact that you're here this morning. Thank you that you want to do a work in us every single day of our life. Thank you that you want to be in this service today and you want to work in our lives through the singing and the music and the fellowship and the preaching, through the giving, that you want to do a work in us. Do your work in us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell some folks around you you're glad to see them today. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, so, a few things I want to tell you about student ministry. And there goes the lights. Um, first off is it's time to think about summer. It, it really is. Summer will be here before we know it. And a few things that we have for our students this summer. Um, students that have completed grades 6th through 12th grade, um, we have youth camp in the month of June. It's June 15th through the 19th. It's dangerous when I'm trying to remember the dates instead of writing them, writing them down. I lose my voice trying to say it because I'm trying to remember. And then we have a mission trip this summer, um, which will be a more construction-based mission trip with the purpose of sharing the gospel while we're still there um, in Fort Smith, Arkansas on July 12th through the 18th. Um, and that'll be for our students that have completed 8th through 12th grade, um, which last summer we had a good group go, and this summer I expect a good group as well. Um, for our youth camp, um, church body, let, let me tell you this, I believe we already have 70 spots claimed um, out of our student ministry, um, which... Um, which will be an awesome opportunity. A lot of these kids that are going to be going are not church kids, if, if that statement makes sense at the moment. So I ask you to already start praying that God's going to move in some big, powerful ways, because if we pray months leading up to camp, it gives even more opportunity for God to really move in their lives. So I, I ask for that. Um, I thank you for being a church body that loves our students. Can I tell you there's not all churches in our country or in our state that love students, but you do, and it's evident, and I thank you for that. It makes serving students here fun, knowing that we have your support. Just a minute, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Just as he was saying, you love our students, but here's a man that loves them too. He's given his time and efforts uh, over the last two years, and uh, we thank you, Matt, for being here these two years, and hope many more, and uh, we have this to give you. Uh, you it's been a blessing to serve with Matt and all he does, and uh, see that uh, the kind of ministry that he does here. It's a little different than the previous guy, but that's okay. We all have our ways of doing things. And uh, he's doing a super job uh, and uh, bringing these kids in from the schools and ministering to their, their spirit. So you continue to pray for him uh, and his family as they do that ministry here. Um, all right, just a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, a couple of weeks, uh, Brother Riley Pippen will be starting a study on spiritual warfare on Sunday night at 5 o'clock. Uh, that'll be in two weeks. That'll be uh, March the 8th. So put that on your calendar. Uh, then also beautiful flowers here uh, today are given by Jimmy uh, Faye Myers, Susan Tyler Asher, 
uh, in loving memory of Jimmy Myers, uh, her husband. So we appreciate these beautiful flowers for us this morning. Uh, Brother Ryan. I've got quite a few things here this morning. I'll be as briefly as I can. Quickly, uh, the ch uh, parents with children, grandparents with children, we have team kids starting up this afternoon, or, or excuse me, this evening at 5 p.m. And uh, in addition to the team kid discipleship program, we also got the children's choir that starts also at 5 p.m. Depending on the age group, kids will be upstairs or downstairs, but I'm sure your kids know where to go. Just get them into the building. We'll take care of them from there. Also, if I could, everybody in front of the pew, you will find our new church track is probably going to be behind the offering envelopes. You say, why'd you put them behind the offering envelopes? Pastor said if I mentioned offering that I could get free lunch. So offering, offering, offering. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got these in before the offering envelopes got put in, but they look like this. If you could look in front of the pew, everyone should be able to get one. I put out 500 and I think 60 of these. Choir should have one. Awesome. What I would like for y'all to do is I would like for everyone to take at least one of these home with you this afternoon and throughout this week, whether you're pumping gas or you are going out to eat, leave this with somebody. This is just an invitation to church. Um, everything that you need to know about the church or briefly about the church is on here, including the address, service times. If people need to know where we're located, we got an address, we got a mini map. Uh, we got everything that you can think of that you need to invite somebody to church on this card. I have 2,000 of these, and what I would like to do over the next five weeks is I'm going to come out late week, and I'm going to put these tracks in the back of the, uh, the pews here. If you could take those out and just hand them out, if we can do it over the next five weeks, pass out 2,000 invitations. Of those 2,000 invitations, if we could see, and I just came up with rough numbers, 7% of the, the invitations we send out of people actually coming to visit, we would have 140 visitors over the next five weeks. If we can get 7% of the 140 people who come to visit, we would see 10 new members over the five weeks. You say, why do you want to do it for five weeks? Because I'm trying to start a habit of every time you go somewhere, give to somebody, give to somebody, because I would like to continue to order these. If I can get everyone to give out one a week, we would pass out 20,000 invitations over the next year, which would come um, out uh, with the 20,000 invitations. If you give 7% of those people to come and actually visit, we would see 1,410 people come and visit the church. Uh, and if those 7% of those people come and actually join, we would see 100 new members. Now, I know these numbers are quick numbers, but again, you can't get people here unless you invite people to come. That's the biggest thing. I've got 2,000 of them, and I, want, I would love, love, love for you to take these. Take as many as you want, but at least take one and hand it out. Put it on, the, I don't care, put them on the gas pump. When you pay your bill at the, uh, the uh, restaurant, when you go to give your tip, slide it in with your tip. That way they know who you are, where you came from. Now, if you do that with the tip, you better tip the person well. <laughs> Don't make the church look bad. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously though, hand these out. Let them know who you are. Let them know that we want people to come and visit. That would be awesome. Uh, next thing, uh, Pastor, I'm a big, big sports fan. Pastor knows this. Um, I play a lot, a lot of basketball. And I told him throughout uh, earlier this week, I said, yeah, I play. And I, I'm not going to mention the church, but I played at another church here in Kilgore. Uh, when a bunch of guys get together, and he kind of, huh? Well, we got a gym, why don't you play there? Well, by myself, it's not a whole lot of fun. So he asked me to start a basketball, um, or start doing some sports here in the church that are geared more towards the adults. We have a lot of things going for the children. We have a lot of things going for the youth. Don't have a whole lot of things going for the adults. So out in the Welcome Center, I have a sign-up sheet for men's basketball, and I also have a sign-up sheet for co-ed volleyball. Um, something that I'm just right now just trying to gauge interest of how many people who would be interested to play and then we will set up a church league from there so we got men's basketball co-ed volleyball I hope that I see a ton of people sign up if not I will continue to play elsewhere <laughs> but brother Mark
Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is all in the name of Jesus. Let's sing together. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. Book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, 
If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Let's have our prayer this morning. Let's pray. Father, your word is true. And we just thank you for that. And we just thank you, Father, for uh, the precious name of Jesus. And Father, I just thank you so much for this day you've given us. I just pray, Father, as we come to this time where we take up the tithes and offerings, Father, just help us to remember uh, those blessings. Uh, we just thank you so much for our, our families. We thank you for our pastor. I lift up Brother Riley as he brings a message this morning, Father. We just pray that you just give your church the words we need to hear this morning, Father. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your grace, and thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. What this world could not see was when they nailed him to that tree. It would break the chains of sin. Thank you. 
troubles they had caused were plain to see. But when the blood came streaming down the cross, when my Jesus fled and died, it started blossoms of forgiveness growing free and love grew where the blood fell flowers of hope sprang up for me Thank you, Brother Mark, and all the people had to say, amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, please. I'm glad that you're here today. Thank you for coming, being a part of our worship service today. I'm honored to, to uh, stand here today and, and bring God's Word to you today. And I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you would, and I'm going to ask you to find Revelation chapter 1, if you would, please. The book of the Revelation, chapter 1. The Revelation, chapter 1. The second coming of Christ is a biblical fact. Timing is not ours to know. In fact, on more than one occasion, Jesus was pressed about the timing. When will it come? What will it be like? He certainly told them what it would be like, and He told us what it would be like. He even gave us an order, but He did not tell us the time, and He told them, yours is not to know the time. So the timing is not ours to know, but Scripture is clear on the things that God does want us to know about the second coming of His Son, Jesus Christ. Scripture will tell us that both in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in Revelation chapter 20, that, that the second coming of Christ is really in two parts. The first part is pictured for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And in that passage, Jesus comes in the air. does not come to earth, but He comes into the air. And He comes for two reasons. Number one, He comes, is pictured there, is His return. The Lord Himself shall descend. And we get a picture of that there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. In Matthew chapter 24, 43, we're told that, the, that His coming will be as a thief in the night. It will be unannounced and it will be unexpected. And that is a great, two great things that we need to be reminded about the second coming of Christ. Number one, it will be unannounced. And number two, it will be unexpected. Jesus said His coming will be like a thief in the night when we don't expect it and when it's unannounced. And there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, we see His return as He comes into the eastern sky. And there with Him is a shout. There is a voice of the archangel. 
The Lord himself shall descend and there shall be a shout with the voice of an archangel. Many Bible scholars feel like this is probably Gabriel that shouts. Most biblical scholars believe that this is Jesus himself, but his voice is like that of a mighty angel. He comes. We hear a triumphant sound. We hear the trumpet of God sound. And the Bible tells us in that passage in 1 Thessalonians that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Can you get a picture of that in a cemetery? Those folks that you love, that you've left in that cemetery, they're going to come alive. They're going to come back again. They're going to have a bodily resurrection. It's known as the first resurrection. And then, then those who are alive during that time, after they have been, after the dead have been resurrected, the dead in Christ, then those who are alive and remain at that time shall be caught up. The word is caught up. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the concept of being caught up is mentioned several times. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this is one time that, that the believers are caught up. We've come to call it the rapture of the church. And then following that, in this concept of the second coming of Christ, following that resurrection of the dead in Christ and the believers' rapture, then soon after that will begin a seven-year period of tribulation on this earth. It's found in Revelation chapter 6 through 18. And when that has ended, when those seven years has ended, the scriptures talk about in Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then following that, in Revelation chapter 19, beginning there in verse 11, we see that second part of the return of Christ to earth. He comes all the way to the earth in His feet come to the earth and he settles here on earth and beginning there in Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 6 is the thousand year reign of Christ. If you're a born again Christian today, you will be a part of that thousand year reign of Christ on this earth. The reign of peace. A reign of power. A reign of he being the king of kings and the lord of lords. And then in Revelation chapter 20, beginning there in verse 7 and 7 through 10, following that thousand year reign of Christ, we understand by Scripture that, that Satan will be loosed again for a short while. He'll have one last rebellion. He'll have one last opportunity to draw people and to keep people from knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But the Bible tells us that at the battle of Armageddon, that will come to an end. And that there is a great angel that comes down and takes Satan by his hand and the Antichrist and casts them into hell forever and ever. And then we move from there to the great white throne judgment where there will be the second resurrection. Those who died without knowing Jesus Christ will be then resurrected and brought to the great white throne judgment, and there is God on His throne. And in that great white throne judgment, the Bible tells us there in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, that all the dead will, will stand before God, and they will be judged according to their works. The books will be taken out. And if a name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, he says they will enter into a place where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth and it's a place called hell and it's real, folks. It's real as this room that you're sitting in today. Somewhere there is a hell that's filled with fire. And people will reside there forever if they do not accept Christ as their personal Savior. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Therefore, after that, we begin to get a picture of our home in eternity, a place we call heaven. And if you have Revelation chapter 1, 
Look at verse 3 with me. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for this moment and for this time. Thank you for the reminder that one day you will step back into the sky and you will call your church home. And Father, we, we tremble at what we read in those years of tribulation on this earth. Father, we pray for you, you to speak to our hearts today. If there is one person that's, that has not been saved today, I pray today might be the day that they would accept you as their Lord and Savior. If there are others that are hungry and thirsting for you today, I pray that they find this day a day that they draw closer to you. Thank you for what we're going to look at today in, in this great book, The Revelation and help us to understand it, and help us to worship in it today. Thank you for the music that's gone before this, and the preparation of it for our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. John stepped foot in heaven. He stepped foot in heaven in Revelation chapter 4. John sees the throne of God, and he sees angels and seraphims gathering around the throne of God, and before the throne of God are 24 elders, and they're worshiping God. Twelve of those elders represent the 12 tribes of Israel, those in the Old Testament that have been redeemed by faith. The other 12 elders represent the 12 apostles of the New Testament who represent the, new, the Christians that are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then John gives us a picture of Revelation chapter 5. And the title of my message this morning is Worthy is the Lamb. Revelation chapter 5. I have five things I want to show you quickly in this one chapter and we will end with this concept of what Brother Mark has led us to sing about today. Worthy is the Lamb. In verse 1 of Revelation chapter 5 we find a great scroll. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. There's a great scroll in heaven. It's in the hand of God that's sitting on the throne. It's a seven-sealed book, a seven-sealed scroll. Each seal as it is opened, beginning there in chapter 6 of Revelation, begins to reveal to the world this seven-year period of tribulations that has a multiple of sevens in it. And as this book is in the right hand of God and God is on the throne, we see not only that there's a great scroll, but we see a great search. We find in verse 2, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? to open the scroll and loose its seals. Who is worthy? Here's a great search in heaven. Who can open this great sealed scroll, this book of judgment, this book of God's wrath on a world that has rejected His name for ages and ages and ages? Who is worthy to do that? And No one is found. Verse 3, no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. There's a great search here in heaven. We see the great scroll. We see a great search. And look at this next verse. There is great sorrow. Look at what John says. I wept much. He cried. I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. No one was worthy. There's a great scroll. There was a great search. And then there was a great sorrow because here was this book of judgment upon unrepentant mankind waiting to be opened. 
and to begin its work in its final climax of this world as we know it. And no one was found to open it. No one was worthy. And John wept about it. And oh, aren't we happy for the next verses? For there, yes, there is a great scroll, and yes, there's a great search, and, and yes, there's great sorrow because no one open, can open it, but then there is a great Savior. Oh, look at this in verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four, li the, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Oh, a great Savior came forth. A great scroll in the hand of God. A great search to find who is worthy. Great sorrow was in John's heart because at first no one was found, but one of the elders came to John and said, Do not weep. The line of the tribe of Judah is here. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is here. And he is worthy to open the scroll. He's worthy to loose the seals and read the book thereof. We see Jesus Christ, that great Savior, Pictured there in four different ways. Look at it with me, would you please? Verse 5, he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah, the royal tribe of Israel. King. The lion in the animal world is known as the king. And here's a symbolic reference to Jesus Christ. He is not a lion no more than I am, but he represents the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's above everything and everyone. No one else was worthy to open that book but Jesus Christ, the great Savior. He's pictured as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first time that Jesus Christ came, remember this, He came as a sacrificial lamb. He came humbly in that, in that, in that birthing situation that we read about in Bethlehem. He came as a sacrificial lamb to die for your sins and for my sins. For in the next time he comes and he's in that eastern sky, he's coming as the king of kings. He's not coming as a lamb, he's coming as the king. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He also is pictured as the root of David. He's a descendant. He's a descendant of David, prophecy fulfilled that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. Go to Matthew chapter 1. You can read all about the lineage of Jesus Christ. And it goes back to David. Prophecy fulfilled over and over and over about Jesus Christ. We also see him as the, as the lamb. A lamb. He says slain. The lamb. A sacrificial lamb of God. In Leviticus chapter 1, the Lord called to Moses and spoke from the tabernacle of the meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any of you bring an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock of the herd and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male 
without blemish. He shall offer it on his own free will. Jesus was that male. He was without blemish. And they did not take Jesus' life from him. He freely gave it for you and for me. He met that law there in Leviticus for that sacrificial lamb. And over in Leviticus chapter 17, we could go there and we could read about the blood, the slain lamb that we read about in Revelation chapter 5. The lamb that was slain, the blood that was shed in Leviticus 17, it tells us without the blood there is no remission of sin. The blood had to be shed. You say, Brother Riley, why? I say, talk to Jesus when you see him. It was just God's plan. And we have to accept it and believe it and claim it as the way of our salvation. We as Baptists have been called the bloody, sal- the bloody religion. That's okay because it's about the blood of Jesus that it had to be spilled for us. Slain in verse 9. Slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 says that this Jesus, this Lamb, was slain from the foundation of the world. Genesis 3.15, we could go back and and read that story there in Genesis 3.15, the fall of of man and woman, and and it's prophesied there in Genesis 3.15 that the Lamb would come and the Lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of mankind. And that would be the only way that we would find a path to God as as a human being, as mankind, slain from the foundation of the world. Before all of this took place in Genesis, God already had a plan. Listen, it's not by mistake. It's not by error. He's not correcting something that went wrong. He knew what was going to happen. And he knew he had a plan. And the plan was Jesus. The Lamb. There's a great scroll. There's a great search. There's great sorrow. There's a great Savior. And look in verse verse 8 through 14. There's a great song. We read about this song there in verse 9. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. We shall reign on the earth. Referring to the millennial thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. This song is a song of redemption. You are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that went to the cross and paid for your sin and paid for my sin. It's a song of redemption. It's a song of rejoicing. Verse 11, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. And that's our song today. Worthy is the Lamb. Who else could pay the price for my ugly sin? No one but the Lamb of God. John standing in that cold river, Jordan, looked and saw Jesus coming down. He did not say, Behold Jesus. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. He understood who Jesus was. The Lamb that was slain. Slain for what? Even Pilate said, I find no wrong in this man. What do you want to do? Crucify him, they said. Worthy is the Lamb. The Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. Do you know this Lamb? I don't know. I'm not saying do you know this story. I'm saying do you know him? Have you prayed and invited Jesus Christ ever? into your heart to forgive you for your sins and be your Savior and be your Lord. It's different. It's something deeper than just coming to church. Oh, preacher, I come to church. Good, fine, but do you know the Savior? 
You see, when Jesus comes again, we're told, I didn't go into it, but we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, all of us as Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're not there to be judged about our salvation. We're there to be judged about our works, about what we've done after salvation. And when he gathers us, and it's not going to be a big crowd, it's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. And he's not going to say, Riley, have you got your church membership card on you? No. That's not going to matter. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14 says, On that day, the day of the rapture, many will be left behind. And they will say in that day, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I healed many people in your name. I did good works in your name. I gave in your name. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not about the works. It's about the blood. The blood that they sang about a moment ago and Mark sang, and Mark sang about. The blood that covers me. The blood that fell from those wounds and from the cross covered me. In Revelation chapter 22 Jesus closes this great book with several verses. I will close my message with this one in Revelation chapter 22 beginning in verse 12. The words of Jesus and behold I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, I have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offering of David, the bride and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Are you ready for that next great event in this world? And friends, it's not the coming election. It's the coming of the King of Kings. And there's no, there's no thing, nothing that needs to be fulfilled before he comes this first part. There are many things after the resurrection of the dead in Christ and after the rapture. There are many things that will be fulfilled before he comes back to earth and sets up his thousand year reign. But there is absolutely nothing biblically that has to be done and finished before he enters that eastern sky and shout like he did at the graveside of Lazarus. And Lazarus came forth bound in grave clothes. And Jesus said, set him free. Set him free. I'm not telling you he's coming this afternoon. I don't know. I'm not telling you he's coming this week. I don't know. I'm not telling you that he's coming this year. I don't know. I am telling you, not according to Riley, but according to this word of God, he is coming. And we have got to be ready and prepared spiritually. Let's stand together. The choir's going to stand. Brother Mark's going to come. Lead us in a hymn of invitation. I'll be right here at the front. If you need to be saved and you don't know how, I can share that with you today. I'll be glad to. Be honored to. If you feel like you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, I'll be here to pray with you about that. If you want to come and pray at these altars, pray about a lost person that you might know, that you might have an opportunity to speak to, you can come and pray at these altars or about some other matter that might be on your heart. This invitation is open to all of us. Before Mark leads us, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the clarity of your word, the simplicity of your word, that we can understand it. 
Help us now to be ready for the great day that you will return to this earth. Help us to be ready spiritually to know Jesus Christ and to be living for Him. Help us to make those decisions today. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Mark, lead us.